Hi everyone, welcome to The Main Dish. I'm Lisa. And I'm Charlie. And today we're going to be talking about Jennifer's Body, written by Diablo Cody and directed by Karen Kuzuma. Why this kind of re-emerged as such a feminist film. What we found was that the Jennifer's Body movie is really a commentary about how women's bodies are commodified in society. And I love how the movie takes a feminist lens and explores themes of friendship and sexuality. I also think that it finds like a unique perspective on the Hollywood film industry. So with that being said, uh, let's get into unpacking all of this. First, we'll start with our appetite. So let's get into it with the appetizer and for the appetizer we're going to do some fun facts about the movie or just facts but I want to start by giving a trigger warning we will be talking about topics of sexual violence and uh, some sensitive issues so if that is sensitive to you in any way at all please check out any one of our videos on the NUTV YouTube channel and with that being said let's get into it. Unfortunately, this is actually based off of a true story, the murder of a 15-year-old girl in California, but how she did not turn into a demon. Yeah, no. She did it's not like, turn into a demon. Charlie was like, oh, this is based off a true story, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> except for the demon part, I think. Like you said, there's not a whole lot of fun facts about the movie, but there are some facts. Diablo Cody, the writer, she was getting off the success off of the movie Juno, and then allow, allow, allowed to write whatever she wanted, and then she said that she wanted to write about what's scary to her, and she said that what's scarier than teenage girls. When the writer Diablo Cody and the director Karen Kusama got together, they said that they wanted to make the movie inspired by by Carrie and how they both have a female anti-heroes and they wanted to do a feminist horror movie with a vintage vibe which I think that they got perfectly down because it is such a campy vintage uh, vibe it's so fun. So there's a lot of references to um, Evil Dead there like Jennifer was asking for the t-shirt back and it was like an Evil Dead shirt. E Evil Dead was also an inspiration for the movie as well as Karen Kuzma actually played Evil Dead too. Um, to the cast to kind of get them fully in the mood for the movie and kind of get for that vibe that she was really seeking for. Yeah, and the mise-en-scene and like the sweat, the set dressing of it all was really on point. Like I really felt like I was in a 2010 teenager's room in the best way. Something that's actually crazy is that the town in the movie is called Devil's Kettle and it's not the name of an actual town, but it's the name of a real waterfall with a mysterious hole that water drains into and apparently never returns from, which is uh, kind of cool that they decided to make that the name for the yeah, so if you're ever going to Minnesota, which I don't think you ever would be, <laughs> yeah. but um, if you can make a f visit at Devil's Kettle, um, the real waterfall in Magny State Park, uh, Minnesota. Um, also, another cool thing that um, I thought was cool about filming the movie is that in the scene where, she's, um, where Jennifer is eating the guy's corpse, they use live rats on set. So they can only film the take of her um, consuming his corpse three times because she was actually consuming corn syrup with a bunch of rats running around and like they, they felt bad for her they, they did not feel that was safe I feel like that's like a workers compensation benefit if like the rats were getting into the the fake body or whatever so those are appetizers and now we are all hungry and ready for the main dish let's get into it All right, now we're into the main dish. So obviously the first thing that you notice about Jennifer's body is that it's a story about the friendship between two women. And yes. it's often seen as a LGBTQ kind of movie uh, inspired, but I actually had a unique perspective that I took away from it. I thought that this was a movie that had a great representation of like a unique kind of female friendship that's rooted in codependency. I found some like research studies and they talk about like this phenomenon with women that they find like very passionate friendships between just two of them that are unique, meaningful, and somewhat committed. So that many of the participants in the study describe being very in love with their non-sexual partner and then they even discussed or explored sexual attraction that they found but it was a sexual attraction from intimacy and not sexual desire. And like I may be reaching here, but I kind of pulled from it that it's this unique attraction and love that they showed, but it's not sexual. It's about the intimacy between the two. And I thought that it was a really cool mm. representation, but that's just my perspective on it because I do see how like the LGBT community would love to take it because yeah, you can't go that way as well. It definitely does have an LGBTQ plus um, reading to it. Um, however, I feel like um, that is like, 
like you said, the most obvious one there is that they have a troubled and a nuanced friendship that goes beyond just like, oh, we're soul sisters, we got this. Um, <laughs> but a lot of the time, we were talking about this, that female relationships in movies aren't fully realized, mm -hmm. right? So there's like, there's multiple levels to their friendship. You know, they had like kind of hatred towards each other. They had a little bit of resentment, but they had deep love for each other. But they were kind of outgrowing each other at the same time. They had different interests, they had different hobbies, they liked different people. Um, but, but they yeah. still loved each other at the end at the end of the day like they still needed each other for companionship and they didn't they understood each other in a way that no one else could mm -hmm. um, so I felt like that was really unique that they depicted that friendship in such um in such a nuanced way because most of the time female relationships in movies are just if, if it's a woman and woman relationship they're either fighting with each other it's a mom daughter relationship uh -huh. Or, um, it feels like one dimensional. Yeah, or they're bullying, or they're bullying. Yeah, yeah. or they're boring, or they're just like boring, like, yeah. you know, like this was a really nice, um, deeper perspective on it. In our research, we found like studies talking about codependent relationships between women and that there were very common themes between codependency and insecurity. And we found that although they were codependent on each other, the most codependent person was obviously Jennifer. And the reason why uh, Jennifer needed needed needy, but needy didn't actually need Jennifer, but she had this deep love for her as it was like a codependency from one side. And I think that they did a very deliberate way of showing this. We never see Jennifer interacting with anyone other than needy unless if it in a sexual way to gain power. She does not speak to anyone else except for Needy. Whereas Needy, we see her, you know, she has a healthy relationship with Chip. She's, her mom is shown, and she's maintaining a balance in her life. She even like talks to like a guy in her class and in a non-sexual way, like getting to know him as a person. And then that's why um, this imbalance kind of came where Jennifer was like a little bullying and like rude to Needy because she was insecure that the relationship was threatened. Yeah, and kind of, it also mentions a really interesting part about insecurity is that it wasn't necessarily Jennifer's fault for being that insecure. Yeah. It was actually the combination of the societal pressures that were placed on her and the fact that she has been objectified her entire life her whole image and her whole self-esteem was kind of just reduced to what she looked like and not yeah. necessarily who she was as a person. When they are arguing at the very end, um, Needy calls her out and is like, hey, you're only skinny because you have to take laxatives <laughs> and you're not socially relevant anymore. Jennifer only valued herself on these things and it was, you know, the objectification that she received her entire life. It's also due to just the male gaze <laughs> being the main perspective throughout media that makes women take their value from that. And that's so ironic because this film turned into something made by women and then <laughs> turned into the male gaze, but we'll get more into that later. But I also wanted to touch on how the fact that they chose an actress as beautiful as Megan Fox, it gives like a <laughs> strong um, statement just to how damaging the pressure is on young women to value themselves through their appearances. Yeah. Especially that scene where Megan Fox is putting on the foundation with tears in her eyes. Is there any girls watching? <laughs> I feel like we've all like been like that, putting on the foundation and being like, fuck me, <laughs> it's not good. You know, just the fact that no matter how beautiful you are, you're going to be extremely insecure due to this world that's made, and it's kind of a never-ending chase. You'll never obtain perfection, because even perfection will feel that way. Okay, another thing that we want to say about female friendship is that we loved how it was a tale of two girls, and how Chip was like the side character, because Chip was used exactly li like a woman is normally used in movies, because it's the loving boyfriend, or Chip was the loving girlfriend, who <laughs> used strictly as a plot point like he'll just be there to love and support and then he's used as there to like explain the movie and be the person who he has to save he was doing nothing there but <laughs> just like being a little object and being like offering yeah. support and it was so funny to see that um, reversed because normally it's the guy and the girl and then the girl's best friend on the side who's kind of like funny but then Chip was definitely used as a plot point there to the point that where it helped uh, Needy realize that um, she had to cut her toxic relationship with Jennifer because once Chip died, once once Jennifer killed Chip, um, mm. that was like the clockwork in her head. But yes, 
Chip was definitely used as a plot point for the <laughs> yeah, the I whole like, friendship to explain yeah. their richer dynamic. I feel like to summarize what I'm trying to say is that in most movies, it's like two guys, and then there's like the loving girlfriend who is in trouble, then used as a plot point. Um, and then this was just yeah. the reverse of that, and Chip was playing that very feminine role. Using a gruesome death for the character <laughs> development of a main character. And also, like, with these female, like, codependent relationships, I feel like, um, you go through so many boys together, <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's just you two. And I know that might sound like kind of silly to say that you go through boys together, but the main plot of every movie is a romance. But then when you're actually living life in like these strong like female friendships, I feel like it's always you two, and then the guys are just like the side characters, like Chip, who yeah. just, you know, come and go, but at the end of the day, um, that's going to be the relationship that stays in your life. So I think it's an important yeah. movie to have something that like shows the beauty of it or how much life can be fulfilled when you're with that person. Because I feel like sometimes we put too much emphasis on romantic relationships when really you need, you know, your one girlfriend to be yeah. there yeah. Um, as you go through like the trials and tribulations with that. Because you're not going to marry <laughs> who you date in high school. You're going to go through trials. <laughs> you need someone there as you go through the ropes. Yeah, I feel like, um, you know, this movie like really depicted that because typically uh, romantic relationships are like kind of the epitome of all like women's concerns in movies and in media. Um, so it was really nice to just kind of see this the opposite way. The movie is completely different from the way that it was advertised when it was yeah. first marketed when it first came out. So it was originally a flop and I feel like we're kind of revisiting it again. When the Me Too movement happened, people were able to read the movie through a different lens and they found it as like a little bit of like a sexual assault revenge fantasy. Um, and then the Me Too movement brought upon that new meaning on it and then that layered it as kind of a new feminist film that people were thinking about it. Oftentimes, women will make something for their empowerment and then it becomes manipulated by men and used against them to demean them through the male gaze. I was reading a research study and it talked about how there's like a common phenomenon where a woman will like post something on Instagram and then like these like harmful accounts will like screenshot the picture, write something disgusting, and they take something for empowerment and then turn it into um, a weapon against them. And this same thing happened with the marketing of the movie. It was made by a woman for mm -hmm. women. Um, and then in the marketing, uh, Hollywood wanted to turn it into this like sexed up fantasy, mm -hmm. like targeted towards 18 to 25 year old boys. And that made it turn into like a box office flop because it was marketed incorrectly. Yeah, and you could tell it was definitely, cue movie poster by the way, yeah. um, you could tell it was definitely um, pandering towards the 18 to 25 year old um, male demographic because it had the same structural elements, the same title fonts as literally 21 Jump Street, <laughs> yeah. the Jennifer's body, using the exact same typography. And it was just like, that was not what the film was trying to encapsulate at all. Another tactic that um, Fox, the marketing team for this movie wanted to do was they wanted Megan to talk to people on amateur porn sites to promote the film. And um, I think now looking back and reading at this now, how um, despicable of a marketing tactic that is and how completely removed from the whole purpose of the movie that is, but they were still trying to objectify um, her body for the sake of for the ends or the means. And I think the whole point of the movie is that uh, when you objectify women just for reaching an end goal, um, for success, for monetary, for fame, for clout, and you reduce like women to just like uh, ends of the means. It's like very troubling to women themselves as they develop insecurities, but also um, kind of commenta uh, comments on how our society is. The way that the band in the movie, they sacrificed a young virgin girl so they could become famous uh, just as their sacrifice. And then that's like a reflection or it mirrors like Hollywood where they prey upon these young women to pedestal these uh. themselves for success by asking Megan to do this disgusting like porn chat thing to advertise the movie. They're preying on like a young actress wanting her to do disgusting things to sell their movie more, to get them success. And there are many different examples of this throughout Hollywood. And I think that that's what the writers were trying to get at when they did um, the band sacrificing her for the for their fame. Megan actually did um, make a point about this that um, in an interview she said that the scene where her body was being sacrificed for the band's success 
Um, she found that in real life her body was also being sacrificed to male directors and movie studios at the time. She said specifically, that's what they were willing to do, to literally bleed me dry and didn't care about my health, well-being mentally and emotionally and physically, as long as they got what they wanted. Jennifer's body kind of flips the script and kind of gives Jennifer back that agency where depictions of women in media um, often objectify them and belittle them to so small that they're just like kind of a plot piece or they're just kind of a ends to a means for greater success of the well-being of this movie. There's so many times that you watch like a James Bond movie mm -hmm. where the female character is just like, it's just like a plot point where he's oh, suddenly reaching more success or he's doing well in his adventures. And now he's now <laughs> she's just a, a plot to show that hey he's doing better now he got he he got the bitch now like yeah like it uh, challenges the traditional perspective of the woman as a victim and asserts like her autonomy in being the controller of her own fate and kind of taking it back a bit. Yeah. Uh, also funny that they mentioned Maroon Five. Okay. Yeah. The <laughs> Maroon Five was so funny. I didn't know what Maroon Five did, but I know they're nasty. Um, funny that those guys wanted to be him. Adam Levine, and we're coming for you. And on the topic of how it was marketed, Ron, when the movie was first released, everyone hated all of the girl characters, but there was such love for Adam Brody, like the actor who played like the lead singer of the band. Sus. Yeah. Sus <laughs> that he was the main character coming out of that, or like the fave one. Yeah, metaphorically was kind of Hollywood and like the desire for greed leading to dehumanizing women and people in general for mm. success. I think that like the biggest thing that uh, people didn't like about this film is that it was putting men in the position of women <laughs> in horror movies where like a woman is like kind of made vulnerable through like getting in like naked murder scenes and like shown through her body and it's like a humiliation thing like she's <laughs> like dying getting murdered to their humiliation but they take this back and they do it to men but they do it strategically I think because for men our value mm -hmm. I mean for women <laughs> our value is based through like our youth and appearance I learned this in a psychology class, <laughs> by the way. And then women value men through their cultural <laughs> capital. And then they do this by turning men, uh, the victims, into the one thing that they don't want to be, a joke or a fool. They make them look stupid. And with the people who uh, Jennifer's murdering, they're all jokes. Like when they do like, the big zoom in on like, the thing, they're all joke and they're all like murdered in a way that makes them look stupid, like the joke's on them and that is the way to demean them in the way that women are often demeaned through their nudity. Very common, like in the horror movie trope, this is like a woman that's just like being humiliation killed, like she's naked. It, getting killed in a movie is already embarrassing enough. Yeah. Like why she gotta be nude doing that as well? Uh -huh. um, it's just so normalized like this um, violence against women, especially in like kind of like the slasher films um, and like yeah. humiliation kills that when Seeing it the other way around, A, it makes the audience uncomfortable, um, but also B, um, when you like kind of flip the script mm -hmm. like that, it just kind of sh goes to show um, how normalized um, violence, like gendered violence is in this type of um, horror movie and kind of in this genre of film. And I think um, Jennifer's body does a real good job at addressing that. Yeah, yeah. I feel like men were like, wait, I don't look stupid. <laughs> that guy character is so not like me. When really they were mad because like maybe in the back of their head at times it felt like them. And then she really manipulated them in saying like, you thought I liked you, but I don't, I'm going to kill you. And then that like really uh, pulls out their insecurity. Not fun being the one that's uh, humiliation killed. So. Yeah, they weren't um, happy. Uh, yeah, I, don't think that, I don't think that bode well with the general audience, especially with an horror audience that is so used to, I don't know, a woman dying in the shower, getting shanked in the yeah, shower. Yeah, they're always and just dying like in a yeah. really hot way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dying in the nude specifically. <laughs> Another um, flipping the script and diversion of stereotypes in the, the genre when, um, because a lot of the time we've all watched a horror movie and we're like, ah, oh, don't go back in the house, you dumb <laughs> bitch. Like, what are you doing? When the guy was like maneuvering through all like the scary perils of um, the demons, you know, they were the making the dumb decisions and I feel like that just didn't bode well with the audience. Jennifer's body's commentary on the Hollywood industry, preying upon uh, young women. This film kind of like flips the script on the whole ho horror genre in general. Gendered violence all the time in horror films. There's an imbalance where things are made for like a male audience and then this really um, reverses that. Obviously gendered audience is tied to the male gaze, but I feel like this really considers the audience audience in that regard. Yeah, um, and I think in this whole process, even though Jennifer is the one, you know, that is brutally killing these these men, these unsuspecting people, um, she's actually a victim in this entire whole movie. And I feel like that 
is kind of a part that people miss. I also wanted to say another quote about from Diablo Cody. She said, we all know the Jennifer types because society creates Jennifer types. There's something about an insecure girl that can make her very intimidating and very creepy. She was only seen for her body within like her peers in high school. They only noticed her like the way she looked. They never had in-depth conversations about her dreams, her aspirations, what made her a person. She really had no confidence and self-esteem in herself to really, um, kind of like see, like rise above the vicissitudes of just like um, mm -hmm. cheap kind of validation. So she's also a victim of herself because um, she was reduced to just so little that mm -hmm. she really um, only valued herself as that and only society valued herself as that. It's kind of a tragedy. And we were able to see this, how they created her as a demon because when she had to be sucking, you know, blood to get like her life force, that put her in a position where she was losing the one tool of agency that she had, her beauty. And then with the loss of that agency, we got to see that um, these intimidating people are the de most deeply insecure ones because um, when they lose that one sense of power, uh, they feel as if they have nothing. And then it makes them do horrible things to achieve it. Yeah. Horrible, like, like for her it was a demon. But. <laughs> Yeah, I think also that um, because she was just like a beautiful woman, um, it was like almost seen as like a burden almost to have that beauty because, um, you know, it was just like a bunch of creeps, A, um, like right from the get go at the mm -hmm. bar. And then B, like a lot of people were like preying on her and hoping to kind of, um, you know, get with her or kind of possess her in some sort of way. And so I think when she kind of becomes a demon and reclaims that back and uses that um, initial attraction that she was um, preyed upon with um, to her advantage to feel out her yeah. desire. Um, you kinda, be yeah. yeah. Before coming, before like becoming a demon, she had no choice but to use her beauty as her form of power and her agency because being such a beautiful woman, she was placed <sighs> in that role where she was constantly getting like approached and preyed upon. So it's only natural for that to be her method of it. And then through that, you know, when that's like your one sense of power, you don't, or like she didn't work on developing her other skills because mm -hmm. that was her sense of power. So it formed her into this kind of being even though like um, it was just society putting that upon her because she happened to be beautiful and then it became her. I kind of took like the opposite of that. I didn't think she had um, um, her body and like her physicalness was actually uh, a, her body and her physicalness was actually kind of a detriment to achieving her, um, her power and stuff like that because um, you know, that's what people would like prey on and that's how people would only solely see her. So then when she kind of flipped the script and used that power to kind of like get back at the people that were objectifying her or they, they thought that they could have taken advantage of her at that given moment in time, um, I feel like she never really had power in the first place. Yeah, like I agree and disagree because on one hand I thought that she had power as and like she was the queen of the school and everyone looked up to her and she was like digging on guys in bars. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, she it was a very false sense of power. Like it's a very limited power. Like she mm -hmm. didn't truly have, you know, any real agency. Mm -hmm. So I agree okay. that it was like a cheap sense of power there. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, no, I agree with that for sure. It was a cheap sense of power. Like, I can't say Conflict she was completely, result. like, completely helpless. Yeah. Because she did, she did have some riz on these people in the bars just because she yeah, looked good. Yeah, she had, like, But it wasn't, like, it wasn't, like, to dominate the world. Like, it's not, like, yeah, a like, power like that. Yeah, like, teens want to be popular. <laughs> she had, like, that, like, kind of, like, superficial lever of power. Mm -hmm. But then, like, in society, she didn't have that kind of power. Yeah, no, um, she... Yeah, I get you. No, I feel you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I feel like that was a really uh, yummy main dish, at least for me. I definitely went into this movie thinking that it would be a little bit surface level, and then we found so many different layers beneath it that I feel very stomached by this. Yeah, you? I, I feel pretty full too. <laughs> um, also, yeah, if you haven't not watched the movie, um, sorry for the spoilers. Uh, yeah, but sorry. I'm, I, we're assuming that everyone has watched it. Yeah, assuming. Yeah, assuming. <laughs> assuming. <laughs> Um, so let's get into dessert. Nice. Nice. Okay, so I think for our dessert, we will kind of wanted to base it <laughs> off the idea of friendship because the whole entire movie really is about um, looking, exploring themes of friendship um, through the feminist lens. So. And you know, most movies don't actually get to look at um, female relationships um, in depth. And so it was kind of a, like nice to see 
um, different depictions of female relationships other than just like two people bitching at each other or you know bullying each other or really not even interacting with each other at all. It kind of made us think because there's such a lack of um, female to female relationships um, in media, <laughs> um, it gave us a chance to like, is our friendship, what, what is, what's our friendship like? How do we describe it? Because it hasn't been described like, mm -hmm. and I think there's that, nothing close to it. Yeah, how do we describe it? And I think that with the huge themes of codependency between Jennifer and Needy, it held a mirror to me and Charlie and we we're like, we need an intervention. Yeah. We are acting <laughs> codependent. But, and then we were like looking at a lot of research articles on like codependency to talk about mm -hmm. it. And they're talking about codependency as like a mental illness and like a huge problem. I was like, man, if codependency is an illness, then I'm fucking sick because <laughs> I love my bestie. Well, uh, uh, yeah, it was also like pause. Like, I don't need WebMD telling me I have a mental disorder at 8 a.m. in the morning. Is like, I pause. Like, wait, pause, please. WebMD. Have you ever been in love with your female friend yeah. in the no. be beautiful way? WebMD, WebMD is have not you ever felt love? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no homosexualness from WebMD, only ugh, Yeah, lame when they talked about vibes. the, um, in research papers, when they talked about the intimacy between female friendships, bro, that's being homosexual. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's and literally just getting with the bros, and the <laughs> WebMD is honestly fucking medicalizing it. But we felt like we should have a bit of an intervention. Yeah. So to decide if we need one or not, we got a quiz about what type of female friendships are you and your BFF. Yeah, a way more trusted medical source than WebMD or Mayo Clinic. What is it? BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's my doctor. I'm sold. I don't know about you guys, but I'm fucking sold. Which iconic duo are you and your BFF? I'm yelling right now because I'm like so into it. Because we're so excited <laughs> about our codependent female Kate, friendship. Kate, is your bestie older than younger than you? You're younger than me. By like a few months. It's still younger. Yeah. Where would you find yourselves on a Friday night? Partying, shopping, at our favorite hangout, at home watching Netflix, somewhere up to no good, or at the movies? Be studying, like honestly, we're <laughs> studying. <laughs> we're students. Yeah, don't tell them that. Don't tell them that. Okay. They, they don't need to know okay. that. Okay. If not. We're probably I'm honestly like feeling at between Denny's. These two. Like yeah. honestly, it's two a.m. and we're at Denny's. Yeah, disgusting. <laughs> at our fave hangout. At our fave hangout. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you and your bestie grow up together? We met um, when we were seventeen. When we first like went to college. So I feel like that's the age when your brain is cognizant. <laughs> so in my head, yes, but technically, I'm no. Gonna, I'm going with this one. Yeah, I'm going um, to Simply just because, yeah. yeah, age thing. But honestly, if you're friends with someone from seventeen to twenty-five. They've seen you grow up. We are not they 25. They really have. Stop like, it. We're uh, not 25. No, but I'm like, 23. You're 23. I just meant the mental. Um, okay, yeah, when, but mentally. By yeah. the time when your brain is fully <laughs> developed, if your friend has seen you through the trials and tribulations, they have been through it all, okay? Yeah, they've been through it all. And before 17, I actually didn't like think. I really <laughs> had zero thoughts. Yeah. If you knew me back then, I was just an empty shell. So. Yeah, if you knew me at 16, you don't know me. You so. don't know me. You don't know me. Uh, what is a word <laughs> you would use to describe your best friend? Loyal, uh, kind, funny, smart, friendly, determined. De um, I'd say you're determined. Oh, I was taking this for you because I already clicked younger. Okay, but yeah, yeah. thanks, I appreciate that. Charlie's determined because she's so, <laughs> she gets A's in absolutely everything, and then in every class since college, <laughs> reliant on her. Uh, what is the, I, Wait, I go with loyal say? for you. Actually, but funny, I don't know. No, uh, boy, I'm like a dog. I don't know. I, Woof. <laughs> <laughs> Bitch, I'm a dog. I'm going to go funny. If your BFF was a member of the Breakfast Club, which one would they be? The nerd, the jock, <laughs> the princess, the basket case, the criminal, or none. Dog, why am I vibing with basket case? I was gonna say, like, I'm definitely the basket case. Okay. I relate to that girl so hard. You are the jock. And the basket case and the jock fall in love. The basket case and That's the jock. That's enough. <laughs> okay, sorry. Like, friendship. Yeah, no, platonic. Yeah, yeah, just, you know, they go together. Yeah. Cute. Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Pick a movie that catches your friendship. Dumb and Dumber, Legally Blonde. Risky Business, Grease, Bridesmaids, or The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. I don't even like The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants the whole lot. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I'm going Dumb and Dumber. Yeah, <laughs> Dumb and Dumber honest. for sure. Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants is another, I feel like, example, side note, of like the relationships between women being one-dimensional. Those girls never had, like, they were just like so blandly nice to each other that like I didn't like make the movie because like their relationships were so like bland, like there's no complexity. Yeah. Anyways, Quick yeah, it was it was nice seeing um, Jennifer and Needy like rip into each other, yeah, like actual female they're friendships. Funny too. Yeah, yeah. 
Because, like, honestly, um, yeah. I feel like yeah, you know, friendships done. depicted are always just so nice. And it's like, I am never just that nice to my homie. You're not actually my friend unless I can be mean to you. Yeah, exactly. Also, that's my sense of humor, sickening enough. <laughs> um, which singer or band do you both jam out to the most? Beyonce, Madonna, Fleetwood Mac, Queen, Adele, or Amy Winehouse? D I'm like, I none, I guess. I would say Fleetwood Mac just for the vibes. I can't that we name go for. one Fleetwood Mac song, but like, name one. Wait, no, just like the out chain, of the oh, chain, like dreams, like oh, I did, okay. Yeah, okay. oh, actually, sorry, I didn't know that was them. Um, yes, that's us. I would just say Fleetwood <laughs> Mac because we. Them. I would say we mostly listen to like chill indie stuff, yeah, and like, like I'm not saying indie. Fleetwood Mac's indie, but you know, nothing else is close yeah. to that. <laughs> okay, tough. Adele, like tough we're, we're crying all day. How are we supposed <laughs> to give a diagnosis off of these? <laughs> All these fucking Wait, music I might have to report my doctor. Your best you get to their heart broken by someone. What do you do? <laughs> Tell them they're better off. Take them out for drinks. Stay home and, with them and eat 50 pizzas. That's excessive. Yo, kill the SOB that left her broken hearted? That's excessive. SOB? Jesus. 50, 50 pizzas is a lot. Set her up with someone you know. Offer some heartfelt advice. Ooh. Genuinely, I feel like between us, we always tell each other that we're better off. Dude, we're like, him? Dude, we got, we got Chandler <laughs> and Joey from Friends. You two goofballs love to have fun Yo, while enjoying the simpler things in life. If you haven't already been roommates before, then you totally should. We have been roommates not, before. <laughs> not only would it not drive you both apart, but it would make your friendship even stronger. Honestly, being roommates drove, they were like, don't move in with your best friend because you're definitely going to fight. After living together, rock on. Yeah. Oh, how um, cute. No, that was actually, no, I, I like that. I like All that. Right. Um, so, uh, I guess for intervention, we don't need to have one because we're not Jennifer and Needy. We are Chandler and Joey. Yeah, Wait. respectable friendship. Who's Chandler? Who's Joey? Oh, I'm Chandler, yeah. you're Joey. Fine. I don't even really like friends, so I'll uh, go with whatever. Well, like... <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, yeah. everyone. Actually, I, no, you're Chandler and Joey. Yeah, sorry, everyone. Sorry if you guys are friends, people. Um, I'm just thankful that we didn't get Monica and Rachel because... Yeah, I'm glad we didn't get Needy and Jennifer, because as we've discussed, that would have not been a good reflection. We would have had to take, right. we would have had to go to couples counseling, I think. So, intervention averted, <laughs> averted the codependency will continue, and will continue into our <sighs> lives, and the more feminist films <sighs> to be reviewed, we're going to keep on watching them, and we encourage all of you at home to keep our feminist perspective in mind the next time you go into watching some movies, and hopefully from watching our show, you kind of got um, a unique lens to maybe apply to when you take home movies. Thanks so much for watching our season. Yeah, thank you so much, and remember that uh, media is not uh, just one way. There's so many nuanced perspectives you can take from it, so it's important to have a critical lens whenever you're watching movies, and not just about the movies, but where they come from. Yeah. Who's, who's writing this shit, you know? Yeah, I hope Where are the money coming from? <laughs> <laughs> for real. Yeah. Everything's for capitalism. Yeah, for All real. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you guys so much for watching. We had a great season, and we really enjoyed hanging out and talking with you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, dinner party ended. <laughs> Making the dream come true.